Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation to speak in the seminar and for being here at the IES. All right, so today the topic is representations of PID groups. So I was told that I should assume that most of the people know PID groups, but I thought I'm kind to minorities, so in this case the minority who doesn't know PID groups yet. You don't need to know too much about it for this talk, but let's just uh, have a quick recap. So if you, if you consider the real numbers, these are just the completion of the rational numbers with respect to the usual absolute value. And what are the periodic numbers? So the periodic numbers, they are just the completion of Q with respect to the periodic absolute value. Where the periodic absolute value is defined as the periodic absolute value of P to the R times S is 1 over P to the R, where S and P are co-primed. So it, this absolute value is very small if the number is very often divisible by P. So it measures how often a number is divisible by P. And if we complete with respect to this absolute value, we get the periodic numbers. And the way you should think for this talk about periodic numbers is that periodic numbers are just a power series in P. So it's a power series. You start with some negative exponent and go up to infinity. You have an arbitrary large exponents in this direction. And the coefficients are numbers between 0 and P minus 1. And if you think about these power series, then you get everything out of the talk. What's interesting is that the real numbers, they are connected. You usually draw them as a real line, while the periodic numbers, they are totally disconnected. So the topology coming from this periodic absolute value is very different in the periodic setting than in the real setting. And that's what we will encounter later in this talk. We'll see that we have a lot of open compact subgroups in this case, which don't exist for the real numbers. And so what are periodic groups? So for real numbers, you can look at real D groups, which are just, for example, GLN over R, SLN over R, SON over R, SPN over R. So those that preserve some inner product, things like this. So you can take compact inner forms of this. And if you now look at periodic groups, you can just do the same. You can look at GLN of QP, SLN of QP, and so on, and take also forms of these. So if you're less familiar with periodic groups, just think of GLN of QP. If you know periodic groups, just think of periodic groups. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so from now on, G will be a periodic group. So that's the main player for today's talk. And what is our goal? The goal, not achieved in this talk, but the goal for a lot of mathematicians for a long time is that we want to construct Um, let me go on here. All smooth, all representations. And I put some adjectives here and I explain them. So we want to construct all smooth, irreducible, complex representations of our periodic group G. So representation of G is just a homomorphism from G into the group of automorphism of a vector space. For us, this vector space is complex, and it's usually infinite dimensional. Irreducible just means, as usually, that our representation has only two sub-representations, the trivial one and the representation itself. So these are the building blocks. We, we just care about the irreducibles for now, and if we have them, we in theory, we can create everything out of them. And smooth means something that allows us to boil down our representation to a category that's reasonable to describe. So smooth is some continuity condition. It means that the stabilizer of every vector in our representation is an open subgroup. And that's what we want to do. So I was also asked to, so I mean, that's my motivation, that's my goal. I was asked to explain why people care about this. That's always a complicated question in mathematics. For me, it's just some, something natural. If I, we have PID groups, it's some algebraic object. If you have an algebraic object, you want to study the algebraic object, the structure, and its representations, and it comes all along. You can also say there are applications um, for various other things. So for example, if you're a number theorist and like to study automorphic forms and the L functions attached to them, which are some generalization of the Riemann zeta function, then if you look at automorphic representations, um, these representations, they can be decomposed into local parts. 
And these local parts are on the one hand representations of real groups, and on the other hand representations of periodic groups. So in order to understand automorphic representations and all this theory coming with it, you want to understand the representations of the periodic groups to begin with. And also knowing how to construct representations themselves, having these explicit descriptions, descriptions helps us to solve a lot of other problems in this area. For example, um, an explicit construction has been used to study distinction of representations. Like in the on Tuesday morning seminar for the special semester, we, we talk about distinction as well. And some special cases have been dealt with by knowing how these representations look like. They've also found applications to theta correspondence. These Precise constructions have been used for, um, for calculating characters of the representations. And wherever I go, I basically find new applications. For example, recently someone told me that the precise structure of the representation that I'm going to talk about later found applications to the mirror conjecture. So apparently, they have applications all around the world. But I'm really interested just in this question as a mathematician. I like, want to understand what's going on. So let's just jump into it and see what we can do. So how do we construct all smooth reproducible complex representations? So there are certain building blocks. And the building blocks for these representations, they are called supercuspid representations. So if you ever heard the scary word supercuspid representation, it just means building blocks. Literally. You can write down a precise definition. It just says that every other representation appears into something, a well-known procedure, which is called parabolic induction, that starts with a supercuspid representation. So once you can know how to construct supercuspid representation, in theory, you, you can construct everything. All right, so what's our goal? Our goal is to construct supercuspid representation, because these are the ones that are very difficult to write down. They are very mysterious. So what's known? So what are the constructions of supercuspid representations? So in the case of, let me, how do I do this? Let me write these two over there to have more space. So the case of, of GLN, is known by now. We know how to construct all supercuspid representations. That was the work of um, Bushnell, Kutzko, and Howard Moy, and a lot of people put work into this. That's known. We also know classical groups. So groups like um, groups that fix an involution inside GLN. So, so nice subgroups of GLN. It's like, like the groups over there. This was very recent work by Sean Stevens. And that's, I should say, for p not equal to. So p is the prime number there. And these are fixed points of an involution. So 2, which is the order of an involution, is usually not a good thing to deal with. So these cases are known. So the question is, what about general groups? So constructions for general, general g, general periodic groups, like if you want to construct them for all, not just for g and n, but also for all the others. So there, much less is known. Um, it started in 90, around 1996, Moy and Prasad. They introduced some notion of depth. So can you see here? OK. So. If you think of the representation, so let's say we have an ocean here which has a, has a lot of fish swimming in the ocean. And the representation of fish swimming in the ocean, that's how Mark Reeder thinks of them, so it's not my idea. And we want to understand these representations. And then Moyen Prasad, they introduced the notion of depth. So the depth is either zero, you can swim on this um, surface, or you can be some positive real number. So that's the depth. And more and Prasad, they associated to every representation a depth. And then they showed that, that um, all the depths of zero representation can be obtained from representations of finite groups. So they basically told us how to describe the representations, the fish that swim on the surface here. So this part is, 
is rather well understood or rather reduced to the finite, um, the case of finite groups. And I should also mention that Morris did the same using a different approach roughly around the same time. So they, they have two, two different proofs. So that was the first thing then. That's just the, the upper part. So we want to go deeper in the ocean. We want to understand the fish that live further down. So, so in 1998, Jeff Adler, he gave a construction of some supercast representations that works for general, relatively general groups that are fish that swim deeper down here. So we now go down into the ocean, and finally we, we see something down here. They were very mysterious. As I said, we only knew them for the special cases before. And then in 2000, um, one, JKU, he generalized the construction of Jeff Adler vastly, so he produced much more fish that swim everywhere uh, around here. So now we're getting a much better idea of who is in the ocean. So do we get all the fish? I mean, that's a natural question to us. To, to, uh, do we get just some of them? Are there weird creatures that we cannot reach? So in 2007, Julie Kim, she proved actually that use construction, yeah, it's all supercuspid representations. Julie's in the audience. Um, so use construction yields all supercuspid representations, but only for very large primes p. So this means now the prime is very large. So let me draw in this direction the prime number p. So everything is for a p id group where you start with the prime number p. And now if I say, OK, in this region, that's where the prime number p is very large. And by very large, I mean really very large. So it depends on the, if you tell me some prime number, I can give you some group and some field for which you don't allow this prime number. Then she showed that every fish here was known. So the story is well known here. That leaves the question, what happens if the prime isn't very large? We are mathematicians. We are interested in, in all primes, not just in the large ones. Um, so recent work, do I have a new color? In 2014, Mark Reeder, together with JKU, they gave some other construction. So they gave the construction of some representations that they called epipelagic representations. And the nice thing is that this construction works for all primes. So what does it mean to be an epipelagic representation? So in oceanography, the epipelagic zone is the upper zone of the ocean, which is the zone that can be reached by sunlight. So if here we have a sun, and the sunlight reaches a small zone on top of the ocean, which is called the epipelagic zone. So the representations that Margarita and JKU constructed are representations that swim up here that have very small positive depths, smallest positive depths. That means we can now actually enter the zone that we didn't no, before, and we know now there are more fish here. Actually, I should say that they gave a construction. They said, OK, take an input that I tell you later about. Take the input. Here's a construction, and the output are epipelagic representation. But they didn't really tell you that the input exists for small primes. So I should add that around 2017, um, partially in a joint paper with Bess Romano, we showed actually that the input exists. So the input for reader use construction exists. 
So that means we can actually go into this zone here. We have fish that swim down here. So that's, that's the current state of the art. So what do we know? We know the very large primes, but there are, there are two big questions that remain. If you look at this picture, there are two zones that we don't understand yet. First of all, there's the question, are there more representations here? What happens for very small primes? We have seen there were some that you did not construct for the epipelagic zone. What if we go deeper in the ocean? And I believe there are more. Um, or, uh, unless I did a mistake, there are more. Um, that's one question. The second question is we have used representations which are widely used, which are applied in all kinds of things. And Julie Kim requires P to be very large. But it seems like there are a lot of representations here. So the question is, is there maybe some, some prime P, so say here is a zone where P is large, but not very large. So it's just not maybe two or three, but it's, it's something reasonable, not totally large. In this zone, can we get exhaustion here? So these are the two questions. For which primes does JKU give us exhaustion? And for the primes that JKU doesn't give us exhaustion, what do we do there? And these two questions, that's my current and future work in progress. So I'm going to give a talk next week at the conference here at the IES, and I hope to tell you about this question mark a bit more. I hope to tell, I, I will tell you what my expected results are, what I hope to achieve during my time at the IES, which is solving this question, figuring out what it means for P to be large, and showing that it's actually exhaustive. So I'll tell you much more next week about what is large, what is very large. And large, large is pretty small, actually. Um, so you're all welcome to attend next week's talk. You might skip the first 10 minutes because they will be very similar to today. And then we dive more into the question marks and I make some more precise statements. What I want to do today is to give you a feeling of how the, do these representations look like and what are, what are the main ingredients? How do we construct them? How do we achieve them? Are there any questions? Okay, so then let's, let's, yeah. Then let's see how to construct supercuspular representations. So there's a folklore conjecture that the following should hold for all supercuspular representations, and all representations known so far are constructed in this way. So there are two steps. Step one is we construct a representation let's call it maybe rho of a compact open subgroup. Let's call this compact subgroup K. So of a compact subgroup of, of the group G. And this uses some filtration of the compact subgroup, so using, using a filtration of K. And this uses crucially that we're working in the periodic world. And that's the part I'm going to talk a bit about afterwards. And the second step is then, okay, we have a representation of a compact open subgroup. So for example, this K could be, K could be GL N of ZP inside inside GLN of QP. So what does ZP mean? It just means we take the power series as over there, but we don't have negative exponents. So we start with A0 plus A1P and so on. That's a compact open subgroup, and we can look at this as an example. And the second step is then that we um, construct a representation of the group G from this representation of the compact open subgroup rho. And here the key word is compact induction. So this means this last step is well understood. Compact indu 
reduction is something everyone in the, the area of representation theory knows. It just means basically we look at the function space of function of g mod k, roughly speaking. Um, and then we act on these functions. So the tricky part is really to do part one. So what you want to do in order to construct supercustal representations is find a good compact open subgroup and find a good representation row of it so that you then, if you do step two, if you induce the whole thing up to the group, you get a supercustal representation. So part one is really the crucial part. And that's what I want to talk a bit more about. So it's known that if the, in induction, the induced representation is irreducible, then it's supercuspital. So all you want is to find a row and a k such that what you induce is irreducible. Okay. Further questions? Then let's go into into trying to understand these compact open subgroups and the representations on them. So this filtration that I've talked about is called the Moiprasat filtration. And I want to show you the Moiprasat filtration for the example of GL2. And if you understand it for GL2, you basically get the picture how it works in general. So I want to do it for GL2 QP which contains, for example, the compact open subgroup GA2 of CP. All right, so how do we do this? We do it in by dividing the group into parts. We look at diagonal matrices and upper triangular and lower triangular matrices, and then at the end we put everything together. So we should start with the filtration of diagonal matrices. All right, what are the diagonal matrices? So they look like ZP star, ZP star, so the invertible elements in ZP on the diagonal. So again, these correspond to power series A0 plus A1 P plus A2 P squared, and so on, where we say we want them to be invertible inside ZP, which means that A0 is equal to, uh, is not equal to zero. In other words, A0 is anything between 1 and P minus 1. That guarantees invertibility. Inside there, we have the subgroup 1 plus P to the ZP on the diagonal. So this corresponds to, this corresponds to the power series 1 plus a1 p plus a2 p squared, and so on. And if we look now at the quotient between the two, what's the difference? The difference is just that here we allow a0 to be anything but 0. Here we fix it to be 1. So if we look at the quotient, maybe use the quotient is just whatever a0 can be. So the quotient is an element of the finite field with p elements that is non-zero, so an invertible element of the finite field with p elements on the diagonal. That's the quotient. And then the next step is we can just continue this game. We require the next to be 1, then the next to be 1, and so on. So the next would be 1 plus p squared zp, 1 plus p squared zp. And we, we keep going. If we look at the quotient here, quotient of these two, the quotient here is just A1 can be whatever it wants to be. So the quotient is just whatever I want wants to be. It's just find a field with p elements. Because A1 can be anything between 0 and p minus 1. And the quotient for all the others will be the same. 
So that means that the quotients are rather easy to understand. These are just some finite groups, finite vector spaces. So what we want to do in the end is to understand this infinite group by understanding all these quotients and putting everything together. So that's, that, that's the underlying strategy. These are the diagonal matrices. Now we have to look at the other matrices. Okay, here you see the difference between good and bad shock. Green is not good. Okay, the color chalk likes Julie Kim. All right. So that was the di that these were the diagonal matrices. Now let's look at the filtration of the upper triangle matrices, so matrices of the form Zp in the upper right corner, ones on the diagonal. In other words, these matrices are isomorphic, so group to just the additive group of Zp. We're just taking an element in Zp and sending it to the matrix with one in the upper right corner. Here it's usual matrix multiplication. How do we define a filtration here? Here it's even easier. You just take Zp inside Zp you take p times zp, so a0 is 0. Inside there, you take p squared zp, so the first two coefficients are 0, and so on. And if you look at the quotient, what you get here is the quotient is just whatever a0 is, and a0 can be anything here. So here it's just fp. Or zero, whichever you like. And the same for the next one. It's also fp, and so on. And of course, the same game holds for lower triangular matrices. So similar for the lower triangular matrices. I guess you get the, the point. So now we have the diagonal, upper triangle, lower triangle. Since all these matrices generate our group, we just put everything together to get the whole filtration. So, um, okay, let me use this. So, how does the filtration of the whole group look like? Now, we can start with the matrices with entries in ZP by which I, I now want to write GL2 of Zp just in terms of matrices. So I, you always have to add that the determinant is invertible, but I, I would drop the index. So I always intersect with GL2. So that's our compact subgroup. Now we go down a step in the filtration. We go down a step in the filtration of the torus and of the upper and lower triangular matrices. So you g we get to um, 1 plus PZP, 1 plus PZP. PZP, PZP. In the first step, it's maybe called this G0, G1. And then you just continue the game. So we continue the game. So the next matrix will be. 1 plus p squared zp, 1 plus p squared zp, p squared zp, p squared zp, and so on. So now, why is this of any use? It's of use because of the quotient. So I've written down the quotients over here. So let's look what the quotients are for the group. If we look at the quotient here at g0 mod g1, what we get turns out to be just GL2 over the finite field. And if we look at the next quotient at G1, so this is just combining the two quotients here. If we look at the next quotient, this quotient turns out to be isomorphic to the two by two matrices over the finite fields. <coughs> 
And that works in general. Well, we get always, as all the quotients down here, we get vector spaces over a finite field. And up there, for the first or the DOS quotient, we always get a group. And these finite objects are much easier to understand than the, the whole big object there. So we study these finite objects to get something of the large one. But not only this, we get much more out of it. So it turns out that these are all normal subgroups in, in each other. So that means that, in particular, G0 contains G1 as a normal subgroup. That means G0 acts via conjugation on G1. And this action descends to an action of the quotients. And this is a linear algebraic action. So suddenly, there's a lot of structure that's hidden in this filtration. So now we have a representation, a representation of a finite group. And so in this case, for example, here, it's just GL2 over the finite field acting on the 2 by 2 matrices just by a conjugation. Or in other words, it's the adjoint action. So that's nice. That's one possibility to do. But so I started with the diagonal matrices and the upper and lower triangular matrices and just put them together in, in the way I felt like. But maybe there are other ways. And it turns out, actually, there are more ways than this one. So in this case, up to conjugation, up to some tiny shifts, there are two ways to put down things together. One is this one, and the other is the following. Instead of starting with the matrices of this shape, you can start with matrices that have a slightly smaller entry here that are divisible by p in the upper right corner. And since you gave the root of this upper triangular matrix somehow an advantage here, what you do is now in the first step, you only change the diagonal matrices. And in the second step, oops, I said only change the diagonal. So the off-diagonal terms stay the same. And then the next step, now you should also change these anti-diagonal elements. So in the next step, you keep the diagonal the same and change the off-diagonal terms. And then you keep, you keep going. So oh, I can write even here in the next step, you change the off-diagonal term. Uh, sorry, you change the diagonal terms and keep the off-diagonal terms, and so on. And these two are the two possibilities that can, can occur, basically, more or less. And now you can say, OK, let's look at this filtration. Let's look at the quotient. What's the quotient here? So the quotient between these two matrices, what did change? The off-diagonal terms stayed the same, only the diagonal changed. And you know the diagonal has just fp star, fp star on it. So this is just, these are just the diagonal matrices over the finite field now. And the next quotient here, now only the off-diagonal term change. So that's just fp, fp on the off-diagonal terms. Because now only the off-diagonal changed. But again, you get again an action of this group. So this is again a group, as you see. It's a multiplicative group on a vector space. You get again a vector space here. And the action is just by our conjugation. So again, you get a group acting on a vector space, everything over the final field. Maybe before I move on and tell you a bit mo more about this in general, I want to just make some, some, re other, some remark how to think of these things. So I've just told you, OK, there are these two filtrations. And everything is basically like this, up to conjugation and tiny modifications. You just have to believe me. Um, another way to think of this is actually these groups are attached to some building, to a Brett-Tietz building. What is a Brett-Tietz building? That's a lot of affine spaces, a lot of RNs glued together. So you take a lot of RNs and glue them together in a nice way. So for example, for SL2 or GA2, you take a, a line and then another line and glue them somehow 
somehow together. And so what you end up with, okay, you draw. What you end up with in the end looks like, like a tree. So now the line is no, I mean, the line that I've drawn before is, for example, this line here. So a lot of lines together. So that's the example for, let's say, for SL2 of Q2. So a lot of lines that you glue together, and locally it, it just looks like a line. And then you associate these filtrations to the building. So the G0 that I've drawn corresponds to, to this point here, while the other thing, let's maybe call it G0 prime, G1 prime, just everything with a prime, um, this corresponds to the middle of the edge here. And the way to think of these filtrations is that this is some geometric object, and you have your periodic group, your SL2 of QP, and this periodic group acts on the object and moves the object around. And this G0 is up to some minor details, just all as a subgroup that fixes the point. So everything that fixes this point is this G0. Everything that fixes this point is G0 prime, up to some minor details. And what? Um, so if the group is simply connected, then the maximal, so the, the first, this G, the G zeros, they are also called parahoic subgroups. <laughs> and if the group is simply connected, the maximal parahoic subgroups, so those that correspond to points here, correspond to maximal compact subgroups. If the group is not simply connected, a few more things can happen, but it's roughly, then basic, then you ca it can also happen that these points in the middle have some target cover that is also a maximal compact subgroup. So, but basic, so it's difficult to say one one correspondence, but some of there is a correspondence. Yeah. So these, this G zero is a maximal compact subgroup. But the funny thing is actually in in SL two, for example, the maximal compact subgroups there are two conjugacy classes. They are not all conjugate to each other which is different for the real groups. If you know real groups, you know there's one maximal compact subgroup up to conjugation, and a lot of things come out of this. And in the periodic world, there might be much, much more. Already in SL2, you see uh, these two matrices over there. So you can intersect them as SL2 to get maximal, to get not the true, sorry. Um, this G0, and then you can take the maximal compact of this shape inside SL2, and they are conjugated in GL2, but not in SL2. OK, so that was a, just a side remark. Um, so yeah, what I wanted to say is, so the first group are the, fixed, are the groups that fix these points. And the filtration subgroups, you can think of them as fixing a small ball of a certain radius. So you, if you take a small ball, that's the next group. If you take a larger ball, it's the next filtration subgroup, and so on. So the way to think of these filtration subgroups just intuitively is, of fixing a ball of a certain radius around a point in the geometric object. So that's not at all needed for this talk. It's just some in intuitive way of thinking about it if you don't like to think in terms of matrices. In general, if you take arbitrary groups, you, you always have the same, the same idea. You have the diagonal matrices that you define a filtration for. You have the upper and lower triangular matrices. In general, these are root, called root groups that you define a filtration for and you put everything together. So in general, it always looks like this. And um, for general, general groups G, so not only for GA2, but for arbitrary periodic groups, you always have that this G0 mod G1 or G0 prime mod G1 prime. So if I write G0 and G1, I just mean any of, of these filtrations. This is always a nice group. Is a, it's called a reductive group over the finite field with p elements. Um, so in other words, it means, what does reductive mean? It just means a nice subgroup of, uh, of GLN of, over the finite field. So these are just groups over finite field. And all these other, this G1, mod G2 and all the others, they are 
FP vector spaces. So that means you started with an infinite group, you started with a compact subgroup K that you want to study, and you decomposed it into small pieces that have a nice structure and are defined over finite fields. And more important, and most importantly, you have always this action of G0 mod G1 acting on G1 mod G2. That's it. Um, Algebraic, linear algebraic action. So that means there's a lot of structure hidden. These pieces, G0, G1, G2, give us these blue dots, the epipelagic representations. And we need the rest of the filtration to go down into the ocean. So the further we go down into the filtration, the further we go down into the ocean. So the depth corresponds to where in the filtration we start. The depth is roughly, so I wrote G0, G1, G2, and the depth here is 0, 1, 2. Here you have to, to scale it. So the depth of this matrix is 0, of this matrix is 1, the depth here is 1 half, here it's uh, uh, 3 halves, here it's 2, and so on. Oh, sorry. The depth of the representation is the sm smallest real number r, such that there exists a point in the building, so that such that there exists a filtration, such that if you go down to the r's filtration subgroup, uh, you have a f to the r's filtration subgroup and take the next r plus r epsilon filtration subgroup, you have a fixed vector there. Sorry, that was the the official definition. It doesn't matter if it didn't make sense. So the depth just measures how far down you have to go in the filtration until you get vectors fixed, fixed vectors in your, vector, in your representation. And this, the depth r is r plus epsilon you have to go down. All right, where are we? We have, oh, so yeah, I s told you there are some nice properties. But still, this doesn't help us if we don't know what these objects are. So the question is, do we know what they are? So what do we know? What do we know about them? So what we know is, in the 80s, Bruet and Tietz, who defined the Bruet and Tietz building up there, they showed what this first group is. So they gave, gave an explicit Explicit description of G0 mod G1 in terms of some combinatorial data. So for those who know what it means, they describe the root data for it. So they gave some combinatorial data that describes this quotient. So we understand it rather well. And then um, in 2016, uh, what I did was to describe um, I gave a description of this G0 mod G1 acting on G1 mod G2. So it's rather easy to describe the vector space once you have the group, but it's, it was not really known what this representation here was. There are a lot of representations here and which ones do occur. Um, and I gave a description in terms of something which is called Ryan modules. And these are just some objects that are very well known in, the represent in representation theory. So if you work in certain parts of representation theory, these are just the, the standard objects that you work with. So I described it in, in these standard words. I also described it in terms of something called greenberg levy theory, in case you have heard this before. And I also constructed a global model, a global group scheme, acting on a group global space here such that if you look at the special fiber, you get back these representations. But that means now we have an understanding of what, what these objects are. 
And now we can actually work with them. Yes. Um, so it's and then I took so it's there's one case where it's the adjoint representation. If it's not the adjoint representation, it's a direct sum of YM modules under minor assumptions, like P not equals two for P equals two. And there might be sometimes if the group is so if the group is split, it's just it's on the nose a sum of Y modules. If the group is not split, it's slightly more complicated, but it's roughly a sum of Y modules, and then there might be a small other piece. Yeah. Or the alternative is it's uh, the adjoint representation. So in terms of Y modules or the adjoint representation, I should say. Maybe I should say one, one remarkable feature or observation is that Actually, these descriptions are independent of the prime p. So we started with the prime p. Everything was for periodic numbers. But the structure, I said, we had indeed described it in terms of some combinatorial data. And this combinatorial data is independent on the prime p. And the same here. I describe it in terms of some y modules, which are associated to some highest weight. And these highest weights are, in an appropriate sense, independent of p. Uh, indep yeah, independent of p. Um, all right. So. That's the structure of the Moltmann set filtration. Unless there are further questions, I want to move on to tell you a bit about the representation. All right. So I want to just say a few words about the representations of reader and you. This, uh, these are the epipelagic ones. These are the, the ones that live in the shallow water up there. So what do they do? They take something which is called a stable vector. I'm going to define this in a second. The stable vector inside G1 mod G2, this quotient over there, actually they take the dual under the action of G0 G mod G1, which we now understand. So they take the stable vector, then they do some construction, and the output are the epipelagic representations. What is the construction they do? So I said what we need is a compact subgroup and a representation of it, and then we just induce compactly. So what we need is a compact su open subgroup with a representation. So from there, you actually you get a representation of the compact open subgroup G1. Because you take an element in the dual, so that just means you take a map from this quotient. And a map from the quotient, you can just consider it as a map from G1 by letting G2 act trivially. So you get a map from G1. You get a character on G1. You have to push it to the complex numbers. So you get a character of G1. So you get a representation of a complex open subgroup. And then you just induce, and you get the epipelagic representations. So once you have the data, it's rather easy. You can actually extend the representation slightly to a slightly larger subgroup if you want to induce irreducibly, but these are just some details. So the idea is take some nice object in this quotient, and then you get the representations. So I have to tell you what these stable vectors are. And the fun thing is actually, so, so far it's, it's a lot of representation theory, number theory, periodic stuff. Now, stable vectors were actually introduced by Mumford and France, or introduced by Mumford and studied by him and others. So this is a much, I mean, it's much older than the work of Rita and you, which was only very recently. So what is the definition? A vector V inside this G1 mod G2 dual. And now I want to change to the algebraic closure because I want to do algebraic geometry, which they used to do over the algebraic closure. So vector inside this, let's call it just V to, to make my life easier, this vector space under the action of this G0 mod G1 
And again, I, I want to go to the algebraic closure, and let's call this blackboard G. And this definition works much more generality. Um, this vector is called stable if two conditions are satisfied, the orbit should be the risky closed. I'm going to show you an example in a second so that you see how these things might look like if this sounds abstract. And you want the stabilizer of the vector to be finite. Stabilizer in the group. So that comes from geometric invariant theory, this notion. So for example, if you start with the group G um, being SL2, so th basically the example are raised but intersected with SL2, then what you get, what we have seen here, the quotient or up there, was that as, as the group we got the diagonal matrices, so matrices of this, this form, if you intersect with SL2, this is just TT inverse, acting on the next quotient that we had were anti-diagonal matrices, so x, y, where the action was just y or conjugation. And in this case, if we take as a vector just 1, 1 on the anti-diagonal, then let's see what is the orbit. So let me, let me draw x, y, so x and y being these, these entries. If we conjugate um, 1, 1 with uh, this matrix with T, T inverse, what we get sh should be something like T squared, T inverse squared, or the other way around. Um, I always mix it up. Let's see. T, T inverse 1, 1, 0, 1 times T inverse T. What do we get? T inverse, uh, yeah, looks, looks correct. And how does it look like? That's just some hyperbola. So that's, it's a curve, it's the risky closed. So we see that the orbit is the risky closed. And what is the stabilizer? The stabilizer of this vector are all these loose matrices that don't change it so that these are just plus minus the identity. So that's definitely finite. So this means V is stable. So this means that's an example of a stable vector. That means if we start with this, uh, we can plug it in here, get a representation of a combined open subgroup, and get supercuspid representations out of it. Yes, but I said I base change to the algebraic closure. Ah. You're right. If I just work with a finite group, it would be boring. But I'm, by saying finite, I mean as a, as a group scheme, or right. I mean going to the algebraic closure. That's, that's why I have to go. Good comment. Thanks. Further questions? All right. So. That's an example of stable vectors. So that means by this construction up there, all we need to get epipelagic representations, all we need to get these blue dots up there are the stable vectors. We have seen one example. And the question is, do there exist more of these stable vectors? So the question is, what about the existence of stable vectors? So Rita and you, when they gave the construction, they gave a criterion for the existence of stable vectors. Stable vectors in this, this setting here. But they assumed that the prime p is large, for large primes, 
they gave a very nice criterion. So the criterion is something in terms of some combinatorial data. And they said, OK, for all the simple groups we know, we write down a list and tell you precisely when uh, do these exist, these stable vectors. And unfortunately, their proof really heavily relies on, relies on the assumption that the prime p is large. And as I said at the beginning, we wanted to get into this zone and figure out what are the fish that we don't know yet. So we were really interested in small primes. But the proof didn't work for small primes. It, it relied on greenberg levy theory and all kinds of things. Uh, but on the other hand, their criterion, their combinatorial data, <laughs> didn't see the prime p at all. So there was no reason why, why should we assume that the prime p is large, except that the proof didn't work. And there was no way to tweak around the proof. It just didn't work for small primes p. Nevertheless, um, Partially, as I mentioned above, partially in a joint paper with Beth Romano, so this special case was treated jointly. Um, we showed that the criterion for the existence of stable vectors holds for all primes p. In particular, for the small primes, in particular, we, we have these blue dots now, and we reach the small zone. Um, as I said, the proof didn't work, so we had to do something else. What did we do? We, what we did is we constructed some global object that allowed us to somehow transfer the result for very large primes to the case for small primes. So we basically observed what, I, what was written on this blackboard before, and I think that these multi-satric filtration quotients, these representations, they are somehow in some sense independent on the prime. They're parameterized by some data that doesn't see the prime. And this was encoded in some global object, and that allowed us to transfer the results. All right, let me stop here and just say, if you want to hear more about this question mark, I'll give a talk about it next week. And now I leave time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.